SJC 13062, Lionel Porter, the Board of Bar Examiners. Okay, Mr. Porter. My name is Lionel Porter, pro se. Mr. Chief Justice and may it please the court. This is a case which involves Article 12 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, Rules of the Board of Bar Examiners 5.1, and Mass General Law Chapter 221, Section 41, governing the unauthorized practice of law. And the combined interpretation and application of these laws in determinations about the petitioner's fitness for admission to the Bar of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. On his 20th application, the petitioner passed the Massachusetts Bar, the written portion, sitting on February 14th, 2014. At some time in April 2014, the petitioner was requested to attend an informal hearing at the Appalachian Board of Bar Examiners, later scheduled for May 21st, 2014. On May 22nd, 2014, the petitioner received a letter from the board stating that his, commission, his admission could not be made at this time. Following an investigation, there was a formal hearing held on March 25th, 2016. On September 7th, 2016, there was a non-qualification report submitted to this court stating that the petitioner should not be admitted. On November 25th, 2020, a single justice of this court affirmed. This appeal follows. The petitioner and attorney Stephen Rones began a business relationship in September 2001. Petitioner is a graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Law. He was subsequently legal redress chair of the South Middlesex branch of the NAACP. In that capacity, he filed race discrimination complaints at the MCAD. At some point, the petitioner and attorney Rones agreed to solicit probable cause findings from the commission. The parties collaborated on a letter that was sent to the commission on the firm's letterhead listing the petitioner as a paralegal. In his first week or so at the Rones firm, the petitioner settled one of the firm's race, uh, gender discrimination complaints for $10,000. Of that $10,000, Attorney Rones retained one third of the petitioner's share. Over the next two years, the petitioner's caseload increased exponentially. At one point, there were 100 open files. The, the petitioner did not have a computer nor technical resources. And the result was some cases were not filed on time and some discovery deadlines were not met. The fact of the petitioner's caseload was noted by Rones in a motion to set aside a judgment involving a case that had been given to the petitioner when he came to the firm. Rohn's statement about the caseload and the inadvertences are notable.
He, meaning the petitioner, researches and drafts key documents by hand as opposed to on the computer. These multiple duties existing on him resulted in the unfortunate but inadvertent neglect in filing the plaintiff's opposition to the defendant's motion to dismiss within the allotted time. There were complaints arising from the missed deadlines. At one point, because of the complaints, a call was made to Attorney Rones by the Assistant Bar Counsel demanding that he sever relationships with the petitioner. The petitioner departed the firm in October 2004. He was not fired by Rones because he was never employed by the firm. The missed deadlines resulted in issues with the Mass Commission Against Discrimination, whereby the firm was disbarred, was barred from filing complaints there, in part because of non-appearance by Attorney Rones in a case involving a veteran, also because of misfiling deadlines by the petitioner, as well as allegations of the petitioner being engaged in the unauthorized practice of law. At one point, the petitioner did not split or share the fees with Rome, but retained them himself, had checks made out to him by the clients. Mr. Porter, may I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Um, uh, first and foremost, um, a lot of people uh, would have given up long ago instead of taking the bar 20 times and eventually passing. You should be commended for your stick to uh, One of the things that the single justice talked about uh, in the decision was the issue with the, the repossession of, of the, the vehicle and, and uh, some of your uh, responses as to how that happened. Can you talk to us a little bit about that situation? Thank you, sir, and I shall. I was studying for the bar um, around that time. I think the year must have been around 2007, and uh, I had rented a place from an attorney friend. I wasn't working, so I be fell behind in the lease payment, so I decided to go to a payday loan outfit that was based in Nashua, New Hampshire, and got a payday loan. The collateral, I mean the security, was my BMW, which was paid for. So this was not a matter of a lender coming after uh, a car that was still being paid for. Uh, I'd already paid for it. The lender and I had agreed because of payments being in arrears that I would catch up. Uh, heretofore, I'd been going to the lender and hand delivering payments uh, to them. In this instance, I'd fallen behind and had gotten assurances from the lender that nothing would occur, they would allow me a chance to catch up. Notwithstanding that agreement, uh, a, an agent was sent to pick up the car uh, I s saw someone outside with a tow truck, lights were flashing. I didn't take note of it right away because I was studying for the bar. But when I looked uh, out the outside again, I saw that the person was still there talking on the phone. It made me uncomfortable because I thought perhaps this was someone coming to, repos to take the car, not repossess because it was, never, it was always my car, it was paid for. Uh, the party apparently went someplace else because I took the car and moved it. And when I came back, uh, they were parked on another street. And uh, at some point, 
I decided to go outside and move the car. The agent saw me getting in the car, turned the key, and he banged on the driver's side, yelled an epithet, and wanted to have me get out of the car. I refused to do so because in my estimation, in my view, there had already been an agreement, okay, that I'd have time to make restitution. Uh, the agent got in front of the car and as I was trying to move it, and I was inching along, you know, not at a high speed, barely moving because I was cognizant of his presence. The intent was not to inj injure him, but he stood there and pushed on the hood and at one point jumped on top of the hood, which I thought was, you know, ridiculous under the circumstances. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Porter, can I ask you a, a, another question just a, for clarification? Yes, sir. You uh, told us that you were not employed by Mr. Rones, and then you, then you also characterized yourself and your efforts uh, for him as being his paralegal. What was your relationship with Mr. Rones? Well, it's been described as a paralegal relationship. I'm not sure that's accurate, uh, but that's... I, I want to, you tell me how you would describe it. I would, I would describe it, as I said at the outset, as having a collaborative relationship with Rhodes. Uh, I don't think it was a conventional uh, paralegal relationship, as I understand it, where someone hires you, you're on their payroll, uh, you have employment benefits, you have benefits, that seems to fit the definition, the more conventional definition of a paralegal. That was not me. We'd come together to talk about uh, how to, in some ways, give me experience, okay, watching a skilled attorney who had a, a reputation as a civil rights lawyer uh, gain skills watching him, learning from him. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a title that I've been struggling with myself because I didn't see it as a, as a conventional paralegal relationship with a firm. Did you find cases for Mr. Harones? I filed cases. Or did you find them for him? Did you refer cases to Harones? Uh, there were cases that I had at the NAACP. There may have been two or three that I referred or brought to him from the NAACP. Uh, now, I didn't market, advertise, or solicit. The cases that came to the firm primarily were cases that were referred by the Boston Bar's Referral Service. That was where the majority of the cases came from. Okay, the remaining came from, were sourced from the letter that we had collaborated on and that had been sent through the uh, MCAD. I did not advertise, solicit, or market. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Yes, sir. Okay, are there any other questions? No, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, thank Mr. You. Porter. Okay, Attorney Walnicki. Thank you. May it please the court, Matthew Walnicki for the Board of Bard Examiners. Judges, we are here today to talk about the burdens and standards with respect to bar admissions. Now, most importantly, the Board of Bar Examiners is the gatekeeper. I'm sure you're all aware of their function. There are certain standards that the Board of Bar Examiners has. They're by statute, they're by SJC rule, they're by the BBE's own rules. Under those standards, the burden is on the petitioner, the applicant, to show that he or she has the requisite character and fitness to practice law. It is very commendable, and I, I agree, Your Honor, that uh, Mr. Porter had the stick to to take the bar 20 times, pass the bar. That's not what brings us here today. Among those standards and burdens on which, again, Mr. Porter has the burden of proof is not only showing the requisite character and fitness, but also if there are concerns in the past to showing that there's been some degree of rehabilitation. Now, when we look through Mr. Porter's papers, we hear a lot, and what we heard today was a lot about what may have happened when he worked with Mr. Rhodes. We heard about the repossession incident. Throughout the papers, we have other instances that are mentioned. The single justice also mentioned in her uh, decision, as well as the board itself in their findings, concerns that the board has with some inconsistencies, possible non-disclosures, inconsistent disclosures throughout the 20 different applications. 
Those are very important when the petitioner wants to satisfy that burden to become an attorney here in Massachusetts. One of the reasons why the petitioner in these cases has that burden of proof, because there's not a right to practice law. As this court held in the Prager matter, becoming an attorney, becoming a member of the bar is what this court has referred to as a peculiar privilege. It's a privilege that someone has to show that they meet that burden in order to practice. And that's because, especially with the Board of Bar Examiners being the gatekeeper, they have to make sure that the person can represent others, can serve a public service. They stand out as an officer of the court. They stand out as a representative of people. So that burden becomes very important. And when we have things like non-disclosures or um, inaccurate disclosures, it's very troubling to the board because then the board has to go through materials to find out what the story actually is, what's going on there. And when we get to the rehabilitation point, the cases talk about that there's no crime or no action that's probably too egregious to prevent from someone from ever becoming rehabilitated and becoming a member of the bar. But that also cuts both ways, Your Honors. You know, in some of Mr. Porter's papers, he suggests that what's in his past isn't as egregious as some of the abject criminality and some of the other matters that we cite. But again, it's a two-way street. When this court says that there's no crime or no action that's too egregious that can't allow for rehabilitation, there's also no action that's too de minimis or too non-problematic that doesn't mean you can skip over the rehabilitation. How, how does he rehabilitate himself? He can rehabilitate himself by showing community service, dedication to the public, education, training classes, and above all, Your Honor, showing a fundamental awareness of what the conduct was what the problems were, how it can be avoided in the future. What I'm hearing today when the questions were asked about the unauthorized practice of law or the volunteered statements about the unauthorized practice of law, I believe he said that Mr. Harones kept his share, yet he wasn't employed by Mr. Harones. I don't believe there's been any acknowledgement throughout these proceedings that there was serious concerns about the unauthorized practice of law. Same thing with the repossession. Same thing with the disclosures among the applications. Rather, when you read the papers, the answers that are given are answers about his counsel during the BBE proceedings not providing him a copy of the draft report, the investigative report. And what happens in these BBE proceedings is an investigative report is prepared they state not only the concerns that the BBE has, if you read the investigative report here, also mentioning any information that the petitioner wants to provide, information about rehabilitation, what they're doing. For example, there's a portion of the investigative report that mentions there wasn't a disclosure about one civil action, but Mr. Porter says that uh, he was not aware of that civil action. And the investigative report actually notes that we went back to the courts and found that his story about not being aware of the default in that action could be supported by lack of notice through the court filings. So it's not a one-sided process, but Mr. Porter claims that he didn't get a copy of that investigative report until his own attorney provided to him after the hearing. Well, that investigative report was exhibit number one, I believe the only exhibit to the evidentiary hearing held by the Board of Bar Examiners. And that argument about not having the investigative report until this proceeding that was never raised at the single justice or to the board of bar examiners after the fact. And again, this is not a right to effective assistance a counsel case. This is not something where Mr. Porter's liberty is at stake. This is a situation where he's trying to meet his burden of becoming an attorney, someone that would recognize that if there were problems with the process, they should be raised promptly. And when we look at what's in the investigative report, that's, that's obviously very important. But what's more important is that Mr. Porter comes to this court and shows that he has the character and fitness, that he has been rehabilitated if there are problems out there. When Mr. Porter has the opportunity in his papers to talk about what he's done, he mentions that he has taught classes. That's admirable. It's vague on what classes he's taught or when he's taught. There's other mention that he feels repentance or remorse for some of the conduct. No specifics, no gen it's all generalities in there. So it's very tough to see that there has been any rehabilitation. 
Aspirations, goals about what he might do in the future, again, those are something that are admirable, but they don't show present character and fitness to practice law. I don't think I need to go into all the details about why the single justice was concerned, why the board itself was concerned. Those are all in the papers. Those are all in the single justice's report. That's in the BBE's report. That's in the special investigative report. It's all out in the papers. The purpose isn't to pile on here the, the concerns that were had, and I'm not going to do that today. If you have any concerns about that, you can look for yourself. The bigger concern I have here is the standards and the burdens, and I don't believe that they are being fully addressed by Mr. Porter in coming to this court asking to become a member of the bar. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them right now. Okay, it looks like we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Honors.